Tourette's podcast is not a medical advice show. It's a show about experiences. In the course of that, we may talk about medications or therapies or stories from the doctor's office, but don't mistake any of that for medical advice or direction. It's not. Get that only from people or places licensed or certified to give it. Not from a massively fun and action-packed podcast about our life experiences. Such as. And I'm just going to say, hey, hey, everything's good. I have Tourette's syndrome. So likely that person will ask me to repeat. What? 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 What that is? This is Tourette's Podcast, part of the Geeks Rising Network. I'm your host, Ben Brown. Okay, so my neighbor just started mowing his lawn. I hope you can't hear that in the background. Anyway, I'm going to keep this intro shorter today. At least I'm going to try. Try, try, try. So we can get to our conversation this week. It's so... I, I can't wait for you to hear it. Peter Zhao is our guest, who a lot of you know from social media as Fabulously Tourette. He's awesome. Going to get to him in a minute. I want to say, so we've grown a lot this season, referring to the podcast. Lots of people listening at this point, and a lot of them, a lot of you, have started at the beginning, at season one, episode zero, which is where I tell my backstory that, that led to all of this. And just so I could kind of experience what people were starting from, I went back to that episode, and from there I went through every single one of them in order, just as a new listener would, or as I hope new listeners do. I did this over the course of the past three weeks, and one thing that's super obvious, I think, is the amount of evolution I've undergone, like I've undergone personally. And, and I can hear that in listening back to the episodes, especially, you know, just, just what I've learned from doing this podcast and talking with you and assumptions that I've discarded, thankfully. And th they're just things I'm glad I went through and mistakes or flimsy comments on my part, probably, that I, I totally heard in listening back, actually. And I, I think I'm getting better at refereeing and dialoguing, if that's a word, because you guys were so great at helping me make the podcast better. So thank you. You know, part of that has been the push for more diversity on this show, which I've always known I needed to do better at, which is way more than a goal for me. It's actually written down on a piece of paper on my desk that only says that, diversify the podcast which is a subject I've talked about in past episodes. You know, I, I've gotten emails from people asking why Tourette's is more common in young white people. Like, why is that more common? And, and I'm not belittling that question at all. I mean, there's definitely a perception that it's mostly a, a white-affecting disorder. And I was always, w without having the data, like the hard data in front of me, I always figured that that had to be a misconception. The statistic is that non-Hispanic white males are more likely to be diagnosed or at least that's true in the U.S., and there's a study I can link to. But diagnosis is totally not the same thing as occurrence. And so I've just figured that, you know, it might not be true, this perception that it occurs more in white males, and indeed it's not true. It can turn up with anyone, speaking generally. And again, there's a study I can link to uh, in the show notes. But I reached out to um, who I'll just call the frequent science advisor to uh, Tourette's podcast, Dr. Christine Conalia. She's a Tourette researcher. I wanted her to make sure that I had it straight, so I just asked her about occurrence versus diagnosis. And she said, quote, My read of the research is that the TS prevalence likely doesn't differ based on any racial categories, and it generally seems to be equally prevalent worldwide. What does differ is diagnosis rate. A diagnosis of TS is more likely in non-Hispanic white people in the U.S. It's likely that the increased diagnosis rate reflects disparities in access to healthcare rather than a biologically based difference, end quote, which is why I'll never have diagnosis of TS as a requirement to be on this podcast. I want more voices, more kinds of voices, and I hope that anyone who wants to put the question to rest by getting a diagnosis, I hope that everybody who wants that has the access to a diagnosis. Because not everybody does, and, and I've heard from them, you know, costs, travel, I mean, you can guess the factors. Anyway, let me loop into the conversation we're about to hear. Because we do talk about this for a minute, the uh, diversity of Tourette syndrome, you know, how it's worldwide, and diagnosis numbers don't reflect actual numbers. And we, and we just kind of leave it in the air a little bit, and so I wanted to go ahead and give you some science and research on this question about, you know, who or what kind of person TS mostly affects, just in case that part of the conversation sparks follow-up thoughts and emails from you guys asking if we do have an answer on that. So again, I'll link to that in the show notes at Tourette'sPodcast.com and at GeeksRising.com. Again, Geeks Rising is the network that has done wonderful things for Tourette's Podcast. By the way, read the original writing at Tourette'sPodcast.com. We're doing guest blogs, and there's some really great stuff. Ed Cooney has a piece up that's, it, it's, it's so good. It's called For the Parents. J just read it, even if you're not a parent. Tourette'sPodcast.com. 
Also check out the video I posted there. The headline is Opening Up for Awareness Month, which as I speak just has two days left. It ends on June 15th. It's really been awesome. There's been so much advocacy out there. Check out the post called Opening Up for Awareness Month. There's a video from a Toretter who's kind of coming out about having it. And he does just a really good job kind of humanizing the explanation. Okay, one more quick announcement, then we're getting right to it. Promise, mark your calendars for, well, uh, okay, so this will be specific to my time zone. So do the conversion to your part of the world. 9 p.m. EST or EDT, whichever you say, on August 12th. Again, 9 p.m. EDT, August 12th, is when I'm scheduled to be part of the Sunshine Summit. That's hosted by Heather Welch of the Sunshine and Power Cuts podcast, which is fantastic. It'll be a live stream, her asking me questions, us talking, but you can participate as well and ask questions. So please come along, uh, bring some fun stuff to ask about. You know, you can ask about Tourette syndrome, sure, but you can also ask about whatever you want. So let's make that fun. You know, just be thinking of things you'd like to ask. Again, the Sunshine Summit, my part is August 12th at 9 p.m. EDT, which happens to be 1 p.m. August 13th in New Zealand time. Heather's from New Zealand. But do the conversion to see when it is for your part of the world. You can access that at sunshinesummit.live. And you can head there right now, too, to see the rest of the guest lineup for the summit, which looks really, really awesome all the way through. Okay, our guest, Peter Zhao, was born in China and lived there as a young man. Later, coming over to the U.S., his mother had defected to the U.S. around the time of the uh, Tiananmen Square protests in June 1989. I'll let him introduce himself, but many of you are fans of his already. Fabulously Tourette on YouTube and Instagram. He's got an interesting explanation of his coprolalia. Listen for that. We talk about his upbringing. We talk about the migration, family dynamics. Quick sensory notice for anyone who might need it. So Peter is a dedicated family man. And during this interview, there's a lot going on. You'll hear it in the background. He told me in advance that there'd be some multitasking going on, but that he was totally ready for the interview. And there's one school of thought, even a dominant school of thought in podcasting, where you really need the environment to be pretty quiet during an interview because, you know, you want the best possible sound quality. But as we start this conversation, Peter's catching up on a bowl of Korean noodles. Later on, he changes his kid's diaper, and as he's talking, and I think he's working in the kitchen at one point, goes outside at one point, I wanted to leave all of that in instead of try to edit anything out for sound quality purposes because I think a lot of Tourette's out there are going to relate to this level of multitasking that's going on. This is also Peter's real life. And I felt like I was interviewing him in his home, in his context, like I was visualizing that based on the sounds around him. So a quick note, you will hear some, you know, some cute child excitement in the background. And at some moments, a lot of sounds are overlapping. And if you have any sensory concerns about that, but this is a truly great conversation that hits on some things this podcast hasn't really hit on before. Language advisory, if you need a few words here and there, you know, some of it is in reference to coprolalia. And you know, I don't censor that stuff. Please enjoy. This is me talking with a fabulous Peter Zhao. Just for the listeners, could you tell us your name and the part of the world you live in and maybe just briefly how you would describe yourself and what you do in your life? So, uh, I'm, I'm Peter. I'm just going to swallow some it's fine beef, you know, when it's cold soup, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're yeah, eating yeah. soup? I'm eating Korean food. This is a Korean delicacy, it's Korean Cold noodles called the nimmyeon, they usually serve in the summertime. But I'm not Korean, I'm, I'm, I'm Chinese. So okay. I'm, P- I'm, I'm Peter Zhao, and the correct pronunciation is Zhao, right? but it's hard to pronounce, but just call me Peter, you know? Okay. Um, and uh, for, for half my life, you know, before this, they used to call me Yan, that was my Chinese name. Uh, but um, I'm, hmm. I'm from New York, I'm a father, I have two, uh, I have being, uh, I have Tourette syndrome for the past uh, 30 years. Um, uh, I came here as a kid. So I grew up in China. I speak both languages. Mm-hmm. And uh, I eat all kind of crazy food. <laughs> um, I've had a, I've had a uh, Tourette diagnosed since 92 in New York. Uh, it was Dr. Shapiro. Uh, he was pretty renowned at the time for yeah. uh, some of his uh, you know, discovery in, in the field. And uh, Introduce some of the newer medications. So uh, I was on ORAP for a good eight years. Uh, I've had a seizure like ticks. I had coprolalia. I've had a pretty damaging uh, intrusive thoughts. Give me some depression related to suicidal tendency a little bit. But you know, but uh, I, I overcame all that and uh, 
and now here I am, you know, doing a podcast <laughs> and, uh, I hope that's a good brief introduction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you're a, a, a father of two. Well, how old are you now? I'm uh, 39 years old. 39. Okay, that's I'm I'm 39 as well. Um, so you uh you have two kids. Are they old enough to where you're able to to tell whether or not they have any signs of TS? Uh, one is uh, almost two. Uh, no, almost two, maybe another few months, you know, but definitely less than five, you know. So, okay, yeah, pretty uh, young. So, yeah, so, like, you know, and the older one is going to be first grade next year. Um, no one exactly have any sign yet. I know the older one is uh, very hyper, uh, very short attention span. He uh, tend to uh, be very stubborn, asphyxiated on things. A lot of times, you know, he makes me wonder about OCD and yeah, even in school, hmm. uh, the teacher does, you know, just kind of watch him a little bit because of some of his uh, more random and more repetitive behaviors. So I did tell the teacher about, you know, who I am, mm-hmm. how, how I am. You know? And uh, so the teacher and I, we have a special communication going on, you know, dialogue. Uh, but we don't think we need any occupation or therapy yet. And so, so far, so good. And I just don't need to be too uh, paranoid, you know, myself, yeah. you know, because you know, a lot of kids that age, they all act like this, you know? Well, the reason I ask is, you know, I I hear from a lot of parents of kids who've just been diagnosed and, you know, they're, they're concerned that they want to be great parents, but this is all new mm-hmm. to them and it's kind of mysterious and they're worried about how to get it right. And when people with TS become parents, their kids are in really, really great hands. I mean, whether they have TS or not, but what I mean is you already have a good knowledge of what it is to have Tourette's. And, you know, not only that, you know, from what I understand about you, you're openly proud of having it. You're an advocate. And th- there's a question in here somewhere, I know, but but I, I think just getting to know you as a Tourette'er and as a family man, we can kind of help to create a better context for people who want to learn more about it. Uh, about t- uh, Tourette syndrome in general, so I'd love to just kind of, you know, g- go back for a bit and build up. Um, so, born in China, d- did were you exhibiting symptoms or, or signs or ticks or anything like that when you were still living in China, or did that crop up when you were when you moved to the U.S.? Well, I, I, the first the first sign. Well, no one really has ticks like that in my family. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I later on I learned that my mom. Uh, my father was even worried about mom. My mom, some of this, her behavioral health conditions, you know, because in China, you, you know, back in the days, you know, cultural revolution, a lot of people in the West and knows about it. Yeah. Obviously, you know, June 4th, we all know it's a different place. So, yeah, so, yeah. you know, it's rough, you know, so, so people grow up, you know, and a lot of times, you know, in my culture, the mental health uh, aspect is often neglected. You know, it's a, a Sometimes it's seen as a weakness, but we don't really talk about it. And, yeah. uh, so my mom has some, uh, my father thinks she's kind of missed bipolar. She's definitely very OCD. But, you know, she never got diagnosed. But the way she, she was brought up, so she, she, she knows that she needs to use her role power to touch against everything, you know? So, right. so she should definitely don't want to, to get diagnosed or anything like that. But being her son, I see the, the, the OCD in her that affects her lifestyle. You know? So, you know, because she has to stick to the pattern and she's so upset about it. And uh, yeah. if she, you know, she don't do it and then she feel bad. It's almost like an addiction. That, that is the very basis of, of Tourette's. Yeah. And uh, I see that in my mom. Uh, she don't have any ticks. So my, my, my tick started when I was eight. I was in China at the time. I grew up in the city of Nanjing. Yeah. And uh, um, I remember I was taking a bath with my father, and he noticed that I like to stick out my tongue. Mm-hmm. So he asked me if I was imitating a snake. Hmm. So while I'm, while I'm talking to you right now, I can feel my tongue moving uh, because uh, the process of the recognition is bringing back those old memories. While my tongue trying to stick out right now, I'm also trying to push my tongue against the back of my teeth. Yeah, that's something. That's something I learned as a kid to 
you know, to stop, to suppress the ticks. Wow. Okay, uh, I see. Okay. So, so, so I ate. So my father took me to uh, see doctor at the time, and 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 doctor just very quickly said, "Oh, he has some sort of hyperactivity disorder, but most likely it's just a habit. It's just gonna go away." Mm-hmm. Right. So, uh, so uh, that was pretty much it. It was like that until until I came to the state, and uh, but you know that's the next question for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> So what 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 brought you to the states to begin with? My, my mom came here. This is right before June fourth, and um, mm-hmm. she uh, because she was majoring in English, so 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 she uh, she used to work in uh, in the whole uh, uh, import export business. So she's into trading and stuff. So mm-hmm. so so long story short, she was here for a, like a joint venture operation between the two countries, but because of June fourth, you know. Uh, that's so kind of regressed, kind of kind of regressed a little bit, and uh, so she found her way out. So so she uh, she defected, and mm-hmm. she stayed and she worked. So so you know so and she had like a like a car accident. Uh, so so mm-hmm. she saw a good chance to uh, legitimately bring me over, and so that's how I came over here as a as a uh, a visitor to my mom and slash immigrating into the country. So so yeah. I came here I, uh, in my fifth grade. So I was old enough to to be aware of, of my, my country, and, you know, my birth country, right? Mm-hmm. At the same time, I'm able to, I'm, I'm new enough to learn new culture, new language, you know, and then draw the comparison. Just, thinking back, it was, it was definitely a good age to come by here. Well, yeah. So, uh, w- what were your w- were your ticks increasing in severity when you moved to the U.S.? I know sometimes you know the, the stress of a of a move, you know, j- just the, a stressful situation can set off ticks, and or having to adjust to something new. Were there any dynamics like that that kind of made it better or worse for you? I mean, give me one second, hey, baby. Listen, daddy's on the phone. I'm talking. Listen, if you know it's cool, most you know the TV, you know, you know internet, right? You know, daddy's a YouTuber, right? Yeah. So right now I'm doing a podcast. I'm talking to a lot of people about Tourette syndrome, right? right? So, <laughs> so um, uh, yeah, um, let's see here. I think my tick, my tick dramatically uh, increased uh, when I got to junior high school because when I first came to the states, because in China we had this, we had this. Uh, uh, this is back in the early '90s. You know, I thought, wow, America is paved with gold. You know. Go bricks road, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, yeah, like was of art kind of shit, you know. Right, but yeah. you know, when I came to New York City at the time, I landed in, in, in Jamaica, Queens, New York, and the, and the place smelled like sewage. I wasn't <laughs> impressed, man. You know, and then yeah, uh, oh, I, had a, I had to go to school uh, in, in the city. I was in Corona, and I uh, didn't class, and you know, it, it, it was it was a different environment. I definitely, I mean. It was more than just white people. It was all kind of people, you know. And it was more than just Chinese people. It was all kind of Chinese people I've never even seen before. I don't right. get to travel a lot in China. And I come here, I've never even met Cantonese. I, I never eat equal Cantonese food. So hmm. even 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 for me within my own culture, uh, you know, I'm a foreigner because I have never been to those provinces. You know, I have no idea who they are. You know, yeah. and, you know like the U.S., everyone speaks English in China. Every other province speaks a different dialect, you know, like another country. So, you know, so I think all that probably kind of threw me into a tangent. And then I think after what happened, after my father uh, left U.S. because uh, he couldn't fit in, uh, he language issues. And hey, baby, my little baby just came out. Hey, <laughs> so I think due to like language language issue, whatever he he left, that was kind of traumatizing for me because you know, my my parents they always fought. Um, uh, for as long as I know. So right. sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm on, a, on my mom's side. Sometimes I feel like I'm on my father's side. So while I'm, I'm in, the, in the U.S., while I'm trying to adapt, while I'm in the U.S., I feel like I'm trying to adapt. So in a way, I'm taking up my father's side. So when he left, you know, I felt very, very devastated. You know, uh, I think yeah. this nap probably just, 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 uh, you know, threw me. And uh, through my threat into into a uh, into a uh, into different stage. So when I got into junior high school, like that's when my threat really got 
severe. Okay, okay. So, so was it was it at that point kind of showing as as coprolalia or just just more severe motor tics or what what it looked yeah. like and all that. I moved. I moved from a rougher neighborhood into a very good neighborhood. I will move to Bayside Queen. Uh, like even now, it's, a, it's still a good neighborhood. I went there for the school district, so it was a really different neighborhood. It was very very white, very safe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Very residential, very suburban, and uh, <laughs> and it was also very very different because I I was taken out from the bilingual class with different Chinese, and then I was I was going into a into another world, you know. And uh, what became more severe was like a lot, a lot more blinking. I think I a starting point of Kabbalah because I was associated with some new vocabularies, like new, even new Chinese curse words. Hmm. You know, I heard them. I just want to repeat them. Yeah. So, 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 so even now I'm telling this, I'm already feeling it. So, so while I'm feeling it, the antidote is already preparing to stop it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and could you just, just for anybody who's listening, who might be new to Tourette syndrome or isn't familiar, could, could you explain the coprolalia part and kind of the, the, the impulse that you feel uh, with that? Yeah, coprolalia, it's uh you no, know, for me, coprolalia it starts as an in, in, in intentional process mm-hmm. because uh, uh, for me, I'm I'm, I'm drawn to uh, you know this profanity, drawn to uh, using uh, these uh, colorful languages. Yeah, and especially as a kid, it's something that you cannot say, and that's just something for me with OCD and ADHD. When you tell me don't say something, I just want to say it. Right? Yeah, so I'm very rebellious. Rebellious. I'm mm-hmm. always a rogue. So all that play into OCD. And OCD is basically uh, increase the speed and turn on the repeating, right? Yeah. So you start repeating the whole song, repeat the whole freaking album, right? So it goes on and on and on. So, so even now I think about the word. Because when I came here, I I I I I, I encounter a lot of Taiwanese people. Right? Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I I never. You know, even back in China, I always knew that Taiwan is the de facto province. Uh, I knew, I'm old enough to know a uh, little bit about the past, which they're trying to erase. A little bit I know about the history, right? Yeah. So I know that, so, so for me, Taiwan was kind of like exotic to me, you know? Huh, so, okay. So when I, came, when I came here and I got to know the Taiwanese people, I'm like, ah, I'm like, I'm like, damn, I'm like, I'm like, you know, you know, you, uh, on, on social media, a lot of time they talk about like uh, uh, yellow peril, how white people looking at Chinese girls. She got yellow fever. Mm-hmm. I have my own fever. I had the Taiwanese fever, you know. <laughs> <But> because, <laughs> okay. Because I'm I'm Chinese. I'm from China, and and Taiwan is just this very, you know, we're kind of forbidden. They they they're like USA. They have they're democratic. They just no. they they already create this whole sense of like you know you know you can't touch it. Right. You know, but for me with Tourette's, the more you tell me you can't touch it, the more I want to touch it, right? So so because of that, it drew me to to feel that, oh wow, this yeah. is new, right? So when I heard when I heard their curse word for fuck, which is gant, G A N and which is different from the way I say in, in Mandarin in China, which in China I'm associated with top. And then I'm like, wow, this is cool. So then I wanna say all the time. Mm-hmm. But because there are so many Taiwanese around I, I can't say it all the time, and then my mom happened to work for a Taiwanese boss, so I'm I'm kind of, I'm kind of, kind of always surrounded by it. So I really want to say it, but I can't say it. So then it, it just kind of repeats in my head, yeah, and over and over, and just like later on with um, fuck, and and also my most prevailing corporale, which is the fuck you bitch. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's stuff that is intentional. But I cannot say it, and because I think because of OCD, you just make me repeat that. Keep on, keep on, keep on thinking about it, because because you know when I was a teen, I was poor, like fourteen, fifteen. Mom and I we all always get into fights and stuff. So sometimes during the fight, I'm so pissed, you know, I just want to say fuck you, bitch, you know. But of course, I can't say it, right? Yeah. So I I just bear it inside. I think from that moment on, it just kind of. I kind of just created this, this, this corporalia. But for everyone is different, you know. Yeah. Uh, to speak to other people how you started. But I think for me, just 
you just talk from a curiosity aspect, and then uh, oh, it has a it's fueled by this my 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 own rebellious personality, and uh, adding OCD, and it just become unstoppable. So. Huh, that, that's a really interesting explanation of coprolalia because I've I've never I've never experienced coprolalia as such. Um, I, I've had you know severe tics and and th- things that are very very visible that make people want to stare, but but I, I've never experienced that. Uh, uh, when did that? So, so was junior high when um, like when did that really become a, an apparent thing for you? And you know if, if that coincided with school, did did that uh, create any problems in the, in the classroom or anything like that? You know, for me, Corbalaria was, uh, it doesn't happen all the time. Uh, it, it has to, you know, it has to happen, you know, at the right place, right time. And, and it's usually, it is, it come, you only come along at home a lot of time with my mom. Involved. So <laughs> she, she, she pointed out to me that, you know, while I'm eating dinner, I'm, all of a sudden I'm showing her the bird. Because so I just, you know, pointing middle finger is also something I did. But I tend to do that at home. I tend to do, do that to her. Yeah. You know, because, um, you know, she, she was, she was, a, she was a single mom. Um, of course, her mom passed away a couple of years ago from cancer. That's so she was a single mom. Oh, sorry, and yeah. uh, she, uh, so, you know, she had a tough life before. You know, she was powerful. She was flamboyant. So, so, so she, you know, she has a very colorful personality, just like myself. You know, so mm-hmm. her and I, we 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 always get into it. Um, it's just like she fought with my my father, she fight with me, or I fight with her. So, you know, so that that play a lot into uh, into my my corporality aspect. You know, mm-hmm. you know. So whenever whenever I'm put into that kind of a Tension, you know, that kind of atmosphere, you know, yeah. feeling that kind of intense tension, that kind of just pushed me, you know, you have to be like, you know, maybe also being Chinese, you know, growing up, you know, because we are disciplined by our own ancient philosophy, like Confucianism, you know, we're all yeah. disciplined to, to, to not to say it, you know, we take, we take pride in, in, uh, in sub, 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 sub to, and, and rather hold it than let go. We take pride in that you know, rather than speaking out, you know. So okay. So 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 we are taught to 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 hold back. So when it comes to anger management, you know, you're holding back is a very bad thing. You know, you're bearing the the, the emotion hmm. and you're not identifying. Yeah. You know? So I think all that. Uh, even now, when I think back, you know, and and analyze it, that's definitely. It's, it's a very complex thing for me, a couple of it. It's not, it's not like um, sometimes you see on YouTube, on TV, how other people who's uh, always exhibiting corporalia as part of their combo kicks. Yeah. The mind is, 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 is very special. So it, it, it has to, I have to, you know, you got to put me into that kind of environment for it to come up, you know. But what's interesting is that my corporalia has evolved into my regular kick, you know. But how so? If you have it, right, if you have it, yeah. How so? Um, <laughs> uh, I never taken like CBIT and stuff because people ask me if I taken that before, mm-hmm. and I said, I said no. I said, I said, you know, early in, in the mid nineties, uh, I never heard about it. Yeah, me and neither. None, none of my teacher told me. None of my uh, doctors told me about it. All my doctors were like either neurologists or some kind of a children psychiatrist who were just very eager about prescribing meds and doesn't give you any counseling. And, uh, but I said, I did go to Torah Syndrome Association, but, but they, they may have told me things, but I was so, in my mind, was so into, into my own problems, you know, I may mm-hmm. not even have heard it. Right? So I said, I never taken it, but I said, uh, I, I practice, you know, I try to do things that I guess similar to what, 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 what the therapy try to do. Like, for example, for Coppolalia, I, I discovered how to do like competing behavior to, to re- replace behavior. So, so instead of being, you know, uh, you know, fuck you, bitch, I'll, I, I somehow realized <laughs> if I reach the right note, hmm. I can replace the urge. So basically, in the end, I, I, I started doing this. <laughs> yeah. It cannot be. <laughs> 
the Kobe Hilton, man. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, in order to hit that, I, I, I was get to, to basically satisfy my entire uh, funky bitch corporate the entire urge, sensation. Huh, it's like okay. Addiction, it's like an addiction. And, uh, okay, baby, I'll get you some right now, okay? So, it's like a, mm-hmm. so even now, when, whenever I have, like, laryngitis, and I couldn't, I lose my voice. Yeah. So the first part of my voice that gets lost is the is the, is the higher notes. So then I, I immediately my ticks become more because I couldn't reach the high note anymore. Yeah, so yeah, I'm, I've, I'm, I'm, I've definitely felt that too. Yeah, yeah. So I'm frustrated, and um, I kept on trying to reach for it, and then you know, so so that's just how how my corporalia evolved. Wow. So for Toretters who have very apparent, very visible, very noticeable ticks. When they're out in public, you know, they can almost not help but to be kind of open about, you know, to, to some degree, be open about, you know, I have Tourette syndrome. There's nothing I can do to hide it. You're going to notice it. You might ask questions about it. But the difference is, you know, are, are you are you kind of scared and ashamed of it or have you kind of self-accepted? And you're a very outward, you know, advocate of of having Tourette syndrome. You know, it's all over your social media accounts. I mean, and it's a really, really admirable thing. I mean, was that was that always there for you, or was that kind of a struggle to get to the point where you could be okay about talking about it? First of all, I have to say you have a great voice for doing podcast. You know, you know, you have a, <laughs> kind you. of a TV personality interview voice. You Thank know? you. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, um, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't I haven't always been on, on social media doing like dedicated correct stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, when I first started uh, I started Facebook over 10 years ago and I had a YouTube account very early. I had a YouTube account around like 2010 at the time. Yeah. And because what happened was after after I I I, I, I had a very, a very early and very long relationship and then, so after it was over uh, uh, so I just trying to find things and do new things, so I so I started a YouTube account just just for cooking. I had a passion for cooking at home, mm-hmm. so I was cooking, and later on, then I got into recording myself doing like uh, car modification and a little street racing here and there, okay. and freestyle YouTube. And but even even in this lifestyle YouTube channel that I created, uh, I didn't specifically talk about that. But it's always there because when I'm talking, you know, mm-hmm. rapping, uh, the ticks were always there. And from from time to time, I'll pause and I'll just voluntarily, you know, introduce myself and talk about what Tourette is. Yeah. But but none of those channels were specifically for Tourette. Uh, around the same time, uh, I still try to visit Tourette Central Association uh, headquarters. Because I'm in New York City and Bayside yeah. is the headquarters. Uh, I went there for for meeting up until like late my my late twenties. They really want me to go back, but I was I, I had this different mentality, you know. I, while I was advocating for rest in the past, I also felt like you know I had this more toxic mentality. I think probably because I, I had a nasty breakup, I was a divorce, hmm. and uh, and. You know, I wasn't so happy with my mom. So, you know, so I wasn't completely content as I am right now. So yeah. I was a bit more toxic. I think, I, in a way, sometimes in Tourette, and I see people kind of just stuck on their own things. I just have negative views about it. So I basically told the association that I don't want to come back anymore because, you know, uh, I'm getting triggered too much. Hmm, okay. Uh, and, and they want me to go because they see, they see me as a positive influence. And I, I, I'm just more toxic, you know. But at the same time, he never stopped me from talking about it. But I just didn't, I just didn't want to be associated uh, in this whole awareness campaign or group. I don't want to be caught an activist. I guess. Yeah. I was still, I was still, uh, I was still growing up, and I suddenly uh, I tasted some really nasty struggle. I had to work it out, and I didn't know how to deal with it. So, uh, but I'm very glad that. Uh, after everything, after everything I went through, uh, you know, one night uh, while struggling with my second second baby, making a bottle, my 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 chicks were just going off the hook. It was like around December <laughs> two mm-hmm. years ago, and uh, <laughs> and I just I just decided to uh, to join Correct Correct 
for a children with support group on Facebook. I just suddenly had this urge to do it. And then suddenly I thought, you know what? Um, you know, I should really do something about my threats. And then my wife has to recommend me. So why don't you start up a new uh, second Instagram account just, just to dedicate to Tourette syndrome? Mm-hmm. So I did. That's, that's when I created my second account as collaborated to Tourette. But then that account ended up became my my, I guess, my gateway for my narcissism. I started posting a lot more selfies than I should. <laughs> so <laughs> so okay. I messed up that account and then I realized that, you know, I said, I'm, I'm, I always so interested in, in, in the preparation part, but I don't really follow through, you know, and it really plays very well with my OCD and ADHD. I mean, yeah. organization is not my best, best thing, you know. So I closed that account and I kept my my, my old account, renamed the fabric to correct, and I just totally incorporated all my life, everything into it. So I thought I don't need to be specific, you know, about correct. You know, it is, you know, it Tourette doesn't define me, but at the same time it is very very much me, you know. So 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 right around two years or so I, I said, you know what, I'm gonna open up another YouTube channel. I might straight into my freestyle rap again in there. Uh, but that is also something I do also for my Tourette. It's I love it. I, I, you know, I, I love uh, that so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, so, so yeah, around two years ago, that's when I finally decided to, to really uh, do specific uh, Tourette syndrome advocacy uh, on, on social media rather than just, 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 just you know, a, a mere glimpse, you know. Yeah. Uh, because I, I didn't want to be associated with other people with Tourette who, who triggers me. But suddenly I realized when you trigger me, it's like a, it's like a nostalgic feeling. I think becoming father or getting old, uh, it plays a lot into it because, mm. you know, a lot of times you get older, you walk around, you smell the same air you smell like from 20 years ago and yeah. you kind of just pause. So when, you, when people trigger me now, rather, rather, rather than me getting upset, uh, I just feel a uh, very sweet feeling to it, you know? I, I really love what you said about um, about how, you know, Tourette's isn't everything about your existence. I mean, you have your other expertise, you have your other interests, but this is all, this is obviously always going to be a part of your life. I, I've, I've kind of gone through this exercise in my head about sort of what this podcast is about and who it's for and what the messaging is. And 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 yeah, I, I you know I, I don't want anybody to get the idea that I've surrendered my life to Tourette syndrome and and just purely to Tourette advocacy, but it is obviously a huge part of me, and I want to learn more about it, and I learn more about it by talking to to people like you. Do you often hear from people who've seen your videos or seen your your social media content, and and they say, hey, I have Tourette syndrome too. I I just want to reach out and say hi. I mean, how often does that happen that you hear from other Tourettes? Yeah, I, I gotta say my my Tourette, uh, social media advocacy uh, 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 really was well uh, well received in, in the public. Yeah, and uh, you know, besides more followers, uh, meeting more friends. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Was was it? You know, maybe you want diaper change? Okay, perfect. Let's go. Diaper change podcast. You know? oh, let's go. <laughs> no? Okay, okay. Uh, okay, okay, okay. I think I just I think I just saw something very bad. So, so <laughs> this is a real podcast. I've had uh, people friending me on Facebook after seeing my YouTube or uh, Instagram videos. Yeah. Uh, a lot of a lot of parents, a lot of moms have uh, have come to me uh, telling me uh, how much um, they appreciate my videos because their sons and daughter uh, like to watch my video all the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, I have I have even had a uh, coworkers and some of the leadership in my company uh, uh, told me that you know their their kids uh, with comorbid symptoms. Uh, some of them have like autism. Yeah, and watch my watch watch my video, uh, and they are they are, they are a fan of my advocacy. And uh, on Instagram, you know, you get to share your your lifestyle. Uh, and women to talk about how Tourette syndrome, ADHD, OCD, or your other symptoms have affected your lifestyle. And you don't have to even have to tick. You can just show the world uh, how you maybe incorporate all this into into your lifestyle, how you do things. You yeah. Know? 
and 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 that's that I got a lot of uh, great feedback, especially uh, QNS dot com Queens Courier. Uh, first saw my story on one of the Facebook groups. Uh, they did a, uh, an article for me back in March. Okay, and right away, uh, World Journal, which is a very large uh, Chinese uh, press journalism, along with China Press. Uh, China Press is more for the uh, mainland Chinese, so they print in the simplified Chinese. Yeah. While World Journal is for Taiwan and every and everyone else that basically reads the complex form of Chinese, so they print that. Okay. So I have both prints. Um, basically, they interview me and talk about. I uh, asked to talk about my story. They feature my story, my photos my online. So. So, uh, so you know, back to your question, you know, the, in the last two years since I started doing advocacy, the, the feedback has been tremendous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, are, are there other Chinese or uh, or uh, Asian individuals who are reaching out to you? Uh, I mean, it's, yeah. it, you, you mostly see it in white it. people, and and I don't know if that's a diagnosis thing or or what, but I mean, I'm I'm curious about that from your your perspective. I get a lot more white people uh, adding me as friends. Um, which I'm not surprised because, uh, because uh, for us Asians, especially in China, Chinese, <laughs> we're, very, we're very close about uh, revealing these weaknesses you know, hmm. especially when it comes to uh, when it comes to these uh, social behavior health things, you know, so hmm. you know, because I guess to us this is more like a, because of the behavior uh, because of uh, our culture, the ancient philosophies we, we follow, uh, the behavior is kind of, you kind of look at it as something that you can train yourself, you know. I, I guess you have bad behavior because you didn't receive that amount of training. There's kind of a shamefulness to it you know, that you couldn't, you know, get yourself to that level, you know. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's a very toxic uh, uh, feeling, you know. Yeah. And um, it's not, it's not a good thing. That's why, I hope more Asian, more Chinese, especially, <laughs> get involved with it. So yeah. I've had a friend to reach out to me on Facebook, especially one guy who, who wants to re- remain uh, anonymous. Mm-hmm. And uh, he told me that uh, he introduced me. He said, I, I should know him because he's part of the circle. And uh, he said, hey, don't tell anybody. He said, even though he, even, he said, he only his wife and parents know about it. Like he has kids who's more grown and they don't even know about wow. it. Wow. Yeah. And, and and he said he, he said no one he, no one in his work know about it. So so he's very secret about it. And apparently he's able to and I think he still takes meds, also medication is secret, uh, but he's able mm. to control it so well. And and but he tells me that he's just very proud of my, my videos. He's inspired by. Uh, and he tells me how much he wish he can be like me, which I tell him, don't think that way. Don't try to be like anyone else. You know. Yeah. Uh, but because I, I always tell people, even I do advocacy, I don't hope people come out and be like me and just talk in public. Right. Right. Uh, for me, it's, it's if you if, if you find what's truthful to yourself, you know. Like yeah. To it, you know. Uh, I, I told a guy, I said, look, man, you know, uh, even though I hope people can, can speak about it, but if you're comfortable with what you're doing now, hey, man, just stick to it, you know? Yeah, but I said, I said, thank you for reaching out to me, you know? But uh, if you want to talk, you know, let me know. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's one thing I definitely value with this podcast is is it, I would never pressure anybody into talking about something that is private to themselves. If they're not ready to talk about it, they don't have to. If you do want to, I think other people could benefit from hearing from you. And, and you know, it, it, and also to, you know, just for anybody listening, um, the, what, the, the comment I made about seeing it mostly in white people, I, I'm not saying that it occurs more in white people. I'm just saying that the sort of landscape and the conversation seems to be, I, I don't know if there are other factors that, that contribute to that because I don't necessarily believe that it's more common in, in white people, but you don't, I, I, that is mostly who I see talking about it online and, and being, you know, having those conversations. And that, that's one reason why I think it's, it's so important to diversify these conversations here. So just as you were not, saying, not all, if, definitely not all white people, right, definitely right. not all white people. Because, totally. because I have, uh, uh, from, from the slew of 
different type of uh, Caucasians I speak to and become friends who have, who have Tourette. <laughs> you know, it's very interesting to see, you know, when I talk to them, to see what the background is, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, you know, one thing that really drawn to me that I really feel great about it is whenever I check out the Facebook and I see how, how different we are being, say, say politics and see the dramatic, dramatic polarities. But then we're able to become friends because we have the common language of correct, yeah. you know, which is a, is, a, is a beautiful thing. Yeah. And uh, um, I think I, I talked to some, some, some of my friends that talked about how their uh, the husband, uh, uh, a few parents, uh, wife, mother have, have talked to me about how how they how they don't have it, their their sons and daughter have it because their father has it. Right? Mm-hmm. But then they always often talk about how they hope they wish, you know, the husband uh, were willing to watch my videos. Um because uh, they feel that you know they are they are unable to to assess you know, who they are, right, right, and because uh, and then I talk, and I ask them about it, and you know, it's it, it's those who have like uh, I think uh, like I said, first generation born here, and their parents from Europe. Mm-hmm. A lot of them are from like uh, Eastern Europe. They have uh, very orthodox traditions, so they're more conservative, and so just like in China. The Chinese, they don't talk about it. They see this as a weakness. You know? And, and mm-hmm. for them, it's just like that also. They see that as a weakness. They don't talk about it. They feel, you know, the power of prayer, God can overcome with it. Yeah. And, uh, and, and they themselves, growing up in America, and, you know, they're, they're, for me, to me, they're white folks. And yet they are very oppressed about Torah syndrome, just like someone from China. And they don't talk about it. Right. And then, but they don't talk about it, but then they certainly act it out when they're upset. You know, they, they, they go through, you know, spiteful behaviors, you know, mm-hmm. every day showing a lot of passive aggression, upset, pissed. And, then, you know, their spouse worry about them, but they don't seem to want to fix themselves. So I, I hear these things. So, so I know it's not every, white person will come out and reach out to me because they have Tourette syndrome. Yeah. So def- definitely, every white person who will reach out to me, they have to come from a different kind of background. And it's very true, those, you know, demographic-wise, folks, I got a lot of people from, like, from, like, the more liberal state. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> and a lot of people from, from Europe, like, the happy country. I got a lot of Swedish, you know, people from Switzerland, you know? Yeah. Um, so, so you have to you have to do with with, with you know geographics, your area, and I think countries with with deeper histories, you know, yeah, uh, yeah, they they you know they tend to you know be very different about Tourette syndrome and their awareness, you know. Yeah, that, that's that that is such an important dynamic that I've wanted to to kind of tap into more on this podcast of just sort of you know, cultural influences, access to diagnosis, uh, sort of social securities for certain individuals who feel more comfortable being open about it versus other people who may come from an environment where it's maybe more risky to be open about it. I mean, that that's, that it's, it's such a huge thing. And that definitely affects, I think, the perception of what Tourette syndrome is and who has it. That's, that, that's a really important thing. And I'm, I'm glad we're talking about that. Like I said, you know, you can, uh, I'm very comfortable with all range of topics, you know? Yeah. Well, do, do you frequently run into people who notice you and seem to to want to ask you about your quote unquote behavior, or do, do you have a like you know public interactions that come from people noticing your tics? Uh, you know, these things very rare now. I mean, I, I, New York City is very crowded. I think I think publications, uh, public transportation every day, mm-hmm. and uh, and people usually see me on on whenever I do tics, especially my vocal tics. They, they usually kind of people who do notice me, they kind of which I I'm really amused by it, yeah. they, they, they kind of they get stunned by me like they saw a ghost or something you know yeah <laughs> <laughs> but, but but a lot of time I also I wish they would come back and, and ask me are you okay and then 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 I'll be very uh, I'll be very passionate about answering that question mm-hmm. you know? that, that question has come up before of uh, how can people without TS uh, interact or ask about like what's the sensitive way to do that I mean is, is that so, so that's how you find um, that's a good way to start the conversation and talk about it. For me, when people approach me um, with question like this, 
uh, to me, I'm always very natural about it. It's just like you ask me if I, do you have a cold, right? and I tell you about my cold symptoms, you know. Yeah. Uh, so when, when you ask me, are you okay? You know, and I, I'm just gonna say, hey, hey, everything is good. I have Tourette's syndrome. So likely that person will ask me to repeat what, 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 what that is. Hmm. The Tourette syndrome, you know. Right. So, um, you know, most of the time, that's when the that's where the question ends. So when the person couldn't understand what, what's the Tourette syndrome, even by the second time, they still don't understand. Hmm. They don't want to be looked like a stupid person, so they will stop asking. They'll walk away. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> so, but if if they still curious about what that is, you know, I'd be very happy to lead you to the next step. So I realized that, uh, uh, you know, sometimes when we do advocacy, uh, we, we're very eager about uh, showing someone something that we do. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. sometimes don't be too, don't be too eager. Don't be, don't be too passionate. Hold back a little bit. Yeah. Because the world, you know, even though you're friendly about showing the world where you are, the world is not ready to to, to want to accept who you are. Yeah. So even even that, uh, it's not about when they don't want to talk, when they don't want to talk to you. It's not because uh, they don't want to talk to you because you know they see you as a freak or something. Yeah. It's because sometimes it's actually the other way around. Like like what I said, since they don't know how to pronounce the correct syndrome, and they feel bad for themselves. Right? Yeah. So, so they don't want to be looked like the idiot. So. They don't want to stop the conversation because they don't know how to even say the word. So why would you want to feel bad for yourself uh, for the fact that you know more than the other, other person? They walked away from you because, not because they're scared of you, because they don't want to feel stupid in front of you. Yeah, that, that, that's a really, really, really great point because I, I think I sometimes, I think zealous is the wrong word, but but I, I do sometimes see kind of a plea for quick understanding from people who may not have the background they need to, to fully understand you off the bat. And it's like, you know, if you want to learn math, you know, you start at a certain place. You don't start at advanced algebra. You know, get you you have to kind of walk people into it and then just kind of peel it away to where they can understand it in simpler terms. And and that's a conversation too. I think that's a really valuable moment and, and a really valuable way of of uh of of getting people to understand you. Uh, without them, you know, feeling like they lack knowledge or feel stupid or, or whatever it is. I mean, it's that that's that's a very good approach of just just kind of subtly walking people under into understanding what your life is like. Thank you, thank you. Have you gone through any sort of? Yeah, uh, you, know, you, you mentioned you know back in the '90s, you know, CBIT wasn't a thing that you know any of us had really heard of. Uh, w- were there other ways of of managing your tics, or was it was it mostly Behavioral stuff or ritualistic stuff, or did you actually use medications? Or well, um, I took medications since I was uh, twelve. I took Orab. Um, I think the other name for Orab is Pimazide. Okay. And uh, the people who don't know what what, what it is, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's antipsychotic. Mm-hmm. So it's mostly for schizophrenia. And uh, around the ninety, they started experimenting these. Antipsychotics yeah. meant help control uh, ADHD and OCD symptoms, and but of course, what they start to realize is these medications have traumatic, you know, uh, mm-hmm. psychiatric effects to it. Um, so, from long term taking that medication, uh, I ended up with uh, uh, very toxic intrusive thoughts. Now, intrusive thoughts is basically a, a repetitive uh, thought. So when you're OCD, if you think about have I turned off the kitchen gas? Yeah. Uh, so if that uh, come random out of nowhere, so if you are eating lunch and uh, you didn't have to make sure you left the kitchen gas on mm-hmm. because you had a one night stand at some girl's house, and um, so this this afternoon you're having lunch, suddenly something pop in your head, and you're like, oh. I turn off my gas. Yeah. So that's more like a intrusive thought, so, right? Uh, that's the like OCD, but but it, just like OCD, you're gonna get stuck in your mind and say over and over. So when I was on ORAP, I had that a lot. So uh, whenever um, I'm, I was doing something, especially say um, playing sports in, in gym class, and I missed a shot, 
and then uh, I begin to blame myself. That, no, no, Peter, you're so stupid. And then yeah. that kind of just throw myself into a whole. The whole world goes upside down, and because I just yeah. I just kept on hearing myself blame myself. You suck. You suck. Yeah. You know, and then eventually this 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 voice in my head kind of became like my mom. My mom, when she lose patience, she was you know just calling names stuff like that. You know? Yeah. And uh, so I kind of begin to hear her name, and I think it's also because uh, you know I I want to tell my mom many times that actually I did tell her that I said the medication is uh is driving me crazy. You know. But she didn't want to stop it. And also the neurologist didn't believe medication have this type of power to control my mind. Hmm. So so I tell my mom that I hear voices that I hear your voice in my head telling me that I'm stupid. So my mom obviously thinks that I created this thing so yeah. that obviously I was jealous or not about um uh but you know, I'm just so frustrated that she doesn't believe it. She actually thinks I'm, I'm making shit up, right? Yeah, that, so, yeah, that, that's that's really important. I mean, because uh, I do that too. A- any minor mistake I'm thinking about for, you know, a, a couple weeks and it really burns and it gives me a stomach ache and it makes me question everything else I'm doing. And, you know, do, do people think I'm uh, just a, a, a disaster or do, do people or do people notice at all? Are people still thinking about this mistake I made two weeks ago? And I know the answer is no. And I know that that it's me, but it still won't go away. Like I'm still kind of torturing myself, you know, c- kind of worrying about that and thinking about what I could have done that was different so I could get it right. And it's that that's yeah, that, that's a part that we haven't really explored too much on this podcast, but it, it's 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 definitely a big thing with me. You know, you know, now now I'm in this whole 180 degree turn, you know, that I feel so content about everything. Now when I, you know, analyze uh, my previous emotions, mm-hmm. now, before I go into that, uh, I learned about analyzing emotions from this other therapy I took. It's a, it's a blessing in disguise. So, so a couple of years back, you know, my mom, uh, she was dying. This is a... You know, a couple of months before she passed, mm-hmm. you know, I was uh, caught in the wrong place, wrong time. I was caught up in this bar fight. You know, I think I drank too much. I blacked out. Mm. So I, I was put into a very uh, incriminating position uh, where obviously I'm guilty. You know, I I didn't even know I I'm I'm capable of this type of martial arts move. <laughs> someone had to tell me about it because I drank too much, but. Obviously, uh, through, uh, you know, through the legal process, so I was giving a chance, so I, I, was, I was told to do anger management. So, obviously, in my mind, is that, uh, hey, I'm a nice guy, right? You know, I'm a Chinese person. I'm, I'm, I grew up learning to hold back, hold back. I, le- I grew up learning to how to swallow shit, you know? Yeah. Uh, I'm a really good swallow, uh, 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 swallowing bad things, you know? That's why, you know, this is, you know, when it comes to immigration, immigrants, Chinese have the stereotype of the sort of minority, uh, uh, model minority. That the Chinese are good at swallowing things. It's very true, you know. Mm-hmm. Our culture, our people, we're very good at, you know, not reacting, not get triggered, you know, not like, you know, speak up right away, you know. We're kind of kind of think about it, kind of analyze, should I say, should I not. Most likely, 80% chance that I'm going to, I'm going to, Swallow the bad feelings and just gonna be the nice guy. Mm-hmm. But by that, paid into anger management. So I didn't know, I didn't realize all this. I like guess going through my mom dying. So I guess with alcohol, I just lost control. So, uh, but I I gave up pride, I gave, gave up ego. I said, you know what, I'm going to try anger management to see how it is. So then I realized, hey, you know, anger management is not all like boring. Like corporate style textbook thing, you know. So sure. I happened to find the right person who taught the right type of therapy. So uh, this Korean guy who's very into uh, mindfulness, and uh, he he's also an immigrant, uh, and uh, he grew up in Korea. He taught something called a, a, a dialectical behavior therapy (DBT). I know some dialectical behavior therapy. Members, yeah, the dialectical behavior therapy yeah, (DBT). Uh, the, the what's great about this therapy is that number one is the founder who's Marsha Lennon she herself was once a schizophrenic patient stuck in an institution so somehow she saw the light and then she came out of it and then she's able to 
sum up her experience as a schizophrenic patient to develop this whole uh, mind, this whole technique incorporated with with, with Asian uh, mindful philosophy. It's it, it's uh, it's 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 for communication. It's actually a communication skill set. We kind of teach you. You know how people talk about take a moment before you speak. You know, yeah. Take a second before you you, you react. This is exactly what this is. Actually, so you, you can ask you to take a second instead of think about the thought process. Uh, they want you to think about uh, your emotions, analyze how how you feel about uh, what the other person is saying and doing to you, mm-hmm. how you want to react to it. Because having Tourette's, having ADHD, OCD, your mind is always like you know, right, just compatulated with all kind of information going on at the same time. And this kind of helped me really hold back. And one one most important aspect of what I learned from this, this, this therapy is that uh, uh, because you need to speak dialectically, you know, because you need to speak with strategy and, and tactics, right? you kind of need to analyze your, your emotions. So tell me one thing is that, uh, you know, about re- a regression. Like when you have babies, you have uh, sleep regressions. They regress couple of months back into the infant stage. And just like correct, we have a lot of behavioral health issues. We might sink into depression. We might use uh, self-blaming, self-victimization yeah. as a way to, to make, make ourselves comfortable, right? We, we go through these anguish moments and we will always regret. I will always regret into these moments. So, so if I continue to beat myself up, have more negative reinforcement and then question myself why I am I such a failure mm-hmm. and how am I going to work myself out of the dark hole so this therapy kind of taught me that that you know analyze emotion knowing the fact that it's just natural occurrence yeah. you know just let, just let them be so so that's why uh, when people ask me how come you're always so positive and I tell them that's because the day before I was also crawling in the darkness yeah, I mean, so at this point, I mean, are, is there anything that you've yet to, I, I don't want to use the word overcome, because I, I think that's kind of a misused word, but, you know, in terms of challenges in your life and things that you want to kind of get a, a handle on with TS, uh, are, are you content right now uh, to, to the fullest, or are, are there still things that, that you're lo- you're still looking for ways to manage? I would say I'm pretty content at, at this point. Uh, you know, of course, uh, uh, when when my tics are more severe, my tics are, are very seasonal. I think uh, in between seasons, especially in spring and fall, I get more severe. Uh, deep winter and uh, well into the summer, I'm less severe. Um, you know, it, it comes sometimes. You know, physically, I feel the joint pain, this and that. But that's that's always something that you can overcome with just regular OTC medicine. So it, it's not a big bother. So yeah, for me, um. I'm very much content uh, with Tourette, but at the same time, I'm not the type who will tell people, "Yeah, I had an easy time, so you should too." You know? Yeah, so, yeah. You know, I, I, to- I totally respect if you if you don't don't have a easy time. If you're still struggling, you know. Just like I tell my friends uh, who who don't want to have two kids or three kids, who want to stick with one. You know, I say, I don't want to be those people who tell you, "Yo, you know, don't worry about it, man. It's easy. I did it. You can do it too." You know, yeah. for me. Everyone have their own degree. Everyone have or their own tolerance level. Uh, so just because I can do it doesn't mean you can. And then you can't use that as a as fair judgment for the quality of a person. Peter, I, I have really, really loved talking with you. I mean, this this has really, really been fun. It's been awesome. It's been enlightening, and I, I really appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome. Man. But as you can see, I'm just so totally comfortable. Uh, with sharing uh, Tourette syndrome, you know, yeah. so I don't see, I don't see advocacy as this whole unfamiliar institution. I see advocacy as simply talking, like right now, right, you know? right, yeah, just having a conversation, and people can listen and they can relate to it and they can take what they want from it. Yep. My best to to your family, and you know, I'd love to keep in touch with you otherwise too. Great, awesome. Yeah, let me know if you want to do a second session of if, if any of the audience have any more questions i would love to uh, do another one in the future great great thank you so much peter you're very welcome man okay i'll talk to you soon all right you have a good one you too take care bye-bye bye, bye.
Thanks for listening. I, I told you that was going to be fun. Please check out Peter online. Look up fabulously underscore Tourette on Instagram. You can check him out on YouTube as well. Fabulously Tourette. Please send me your thoughts about this episode. Would love to hear from you. If you've sent me an email and I haven't replied yet, I'm so sorry. I promise you I've read it. I promise you I'm going to get back to you. Please keep it coming. I love hearing from you guys. And every comment, every criticism, every nice thing you say totally helps the podcast. By the way, I asked my dad for another one of his band's names, you know, to follow up on last week and the conversation about changing the name of something to kind of stay ahead of it. And he told me, Yellow Submarine. And I'll leave you with that, I guess. Um, Please visit Tourette'sPodcast.com. Be a part of the Tourette's Podcast discussion group on Facebook. Thanks to Sophia, who runs the group for us. If you want to support the podcast and help cover its expenses, head to Patreon.com slash Tourette's Podcast. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Patreon.com slash Tourette's Podcast. Thank you so much to everybody supporting the show. That's amazing. At Tourette's Pod on Twitter, you can check out past episodes and explore other fantastic podcasts from Geeks Rising at geeksrising.com. What am I forgetting? Send me an email to remind me, Podcast at gmail.com. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. Talk to you in the meantime. This is Ben.